Welcome back, we're gonna have a really short discussion today about black holes and sinkholes. Trust me, it's gonna be short, it's gonna be easy. So let's get started. We do have a lot of filtering methods that we've covered so far. We can, you know, inspect the frames, we can inspect the packets, we can inspect the sessions, the application contents even, at layer 7. The problem is that all this inspection and decision process is gonna take time, it's gonna take CPU time. Your devices will be spending their CPU cycles and their memory deciding and acting and matching on those policies and dropping or, or cleaning up or redirecting the malicious traffic. Now, if you're facing a denial of service attack, this sort of CPU load might actually be the target of the denial of service attack itself, overloading your network or your security devices, their CPUs, their memory with so many fake or spoofed decisions that legitimate traffic cannot get through any longer. So this is where another concept of black holes and sinkholes comes to the rescue. Now their purpose is to send traffic to the great unknown. <laughs> so we're basically talking about dropping the traffic, all right? We, we, we identify some type of traffic that is pure garbage, we just wanna drop it as quickly as possible. Now where do we configure this functionality? Well, we could configure this on a routing device which basically means a router or a next generation firewall, any, any type of layer 3 device with routing capabilities. They can just drop this traffic or just specific traffic completely, but it's pretty difficult to match on that specific type of traffic because if it's a denial of service attack coming from one single source, we might be able to pinpoint that source and create an access list entry that denies that specific type of traffic. But if it's a botnet, behind that attack if it's a distributed denial of service and we can see malicious traffic flooding traffic coming from 10,000 IP addresses all over the internet well that type of incident response in order to create the appropriate access list and filter that type of traffic is going to create some difficulties so we have the concept of a black hole that's a concept that we can find in a lot of uh, networking architectures as well, because just sometimes we just want to drop specific type of traffic, even if it's not malicious. Now, as traffic comes in, we know that we don't want it, all right? So we just drop it and we don't notify anyone that we dropped it. It's also useful for mitigating denial of service attacks, also distributed denial of service attacks if you can match that traffic. And we do have several implementations for these black holes, depending on the operating system that you're using. For example, we have the null zero interface in Cisco devices, or we have the slash dev slash null, also kind of a virtual interface in Linux systems. Actually, it's a file on the file system because, you know, in Linux, everything is a file, but, you know, try to get over that type of abstraction and think of the fact that the dev null file is actually... Uh, the place of no return, right? The, the place where you send data and it's completely lost. And the DevNull approach is often used by network appliances as well, especially those that are based on a Linux operating system, because it's considered to be less CPU intensive, especially in the context of a denial of service attack happening at the same time. Now, careful with these as you might be dropping useful traffic as well. So you can denial the service out of yourself if you're not careful, <laughs> not by overloading anything, but by dropping useful and legitimate traffic. That's why I said it's it's sometimes a challenge to match the exact traffic that is part of the denial of service attack and not everything else that enters your network interface. Now, there is some CPU involvement in black hole routing as well. Of course, for very large enterprise networks, there are dedicated devices for managing denial of service attacks. So we dedicate some physical devices, physical appliances, especially for <laughs> denial of service attacks, uh, which usually rely on a hardware accelerated decision process because it's that much faster to process something in a, in a dedicated circuit, in an ASIC, uh, than it is to process it uh, along with the rest of the CPU instructions. So you are able to mitigate and filter the denial of service traffic at wire speed which means that the CPU is not a bottleneck. That's what wire speed means. You're basically uh, processing the traffic as fast as it can enter your network interface or as fast as the, the wire that connects the network interface is going to allow it. 
a lot of vendors out there that are building, developing these type of anti DDoS solutions. Uh, just to mention a few Arbor Networks or Fortinet, they all have dedicated appliances for this type of functionality. Actually, you can see that Fortinet also has it as a physical appliance as well as a virtual machine. Now you can have a look over the data sheets of, uh, of these solutions just to get a better picture of how they work and what type of, uh, of benefits they bring you. Uh, or you can just uh, you know skim the, the features here listed, which are going to list all the, the major behavioral methods or traffic inspection methods that the anti-DDoS device can apply in order to match to identify the traffic that is part of the DDoS attack. As you can see, most of the features here are not related to what the device can do because it kind of does one single thing it drops traffic right so most of the the most of the features are actually features for identifying that malicious traffic that's what we're concerned with another approach here is by using what is called a sinkhole now a sinkhole is very similar to a black hole but in case of a sinkhole you retain some ability to analyze the drop traffic so you're not just dropping it you're dropping it into a bucket Okay, not an object bucket. Oh my god, we're running out of out of terms in IT. Uh, we're just dropping the traffic onto some kind of packet capturing system that allows us to later on analyze what type of attack was it, where did it came from, what type of payload was it using, in order to perhaps be able to mitigate it or identify who the uh, malicious attacker is, and perhaps even avoid that type of attack later on in the future. So how do we do this? Well, we have to redirect the traffic to a specific analysis server. It might just be a simple server that performs packet capturing, or it can be some kind of a honeypot or a honey net. Remember, we already talked about this one in a previous video. And a very important exam topic here, I would say, to keep in mind the fact that there is also the concept of a DNS sinkhole. Now, the DNS sinkhole actually relies on a reconfiguration of the DNS information in order to drop this malicious traffic. And we can perform this in two different uh, directions. We can have this configured outside in, so from the internet towards our internal network, which means that we're going to be self-poisoning our own DNS servers to make the traffic that is trying to reach them reach some other point rather than your servers because we know we are under a large scale denial of service attack so we're basically trying to redirect any kind of traffic that is heading towards our victim servers and we're redirecting this by using a dns redirection which means we're basically self-poisoning our own dns servers our own dns database to redirect to the great unknown, the traffic that we've just identified that is targeting some specific services, public services uh, in, our, in our network. So we're trying to redirect the traffic so it doesn't reach our real servers. Now, of course, this is also going to redirect legitimate traffic as well, but if you're facing a large scale denial of service attack, maybe in just one single region of the world, especially if your infrastructure spans multiple regions, uh, perhaps it's hosted in some kind of public cloud, for example, well, that would be a good approach to protect that specific region and perhaps just redirect all the, uh, all the valid requests to some other regions that are not under the same denial of service attack. Now, we can also perform this type of protection using a DNS sinkhole from inside to the outside, from so from inside our local network to the internet. Uh, in this way, the sinkhole configuration from the DNS server can cause to redirect or drop our own traffic initiated from within the internal network that is trying to reach some command and control server. So what we're doing is trying to drop the traffic generated by those compromised hosts, the compromised devices that we've identified within our network and uh, forbid them from, uh, from really accessing their command and control center on the internet. Now, you also have to keep in mind that both black hole and sinkhole filtering are sometimes implemented by some vendors with the implication of the ISP, that's the Internet Service Provider, because uh, filtering distributed denial of service traffic 
on the ISP's network is much more efficient than doing it at your network edge. A high volume DDoS attack might completely saturate your ISP link so that all the traffic that you're receiving is DDoS traffic. If you just drop it, you're left with nothing, okay? Uh, so if you do it on the ISP's network, which is most likely gonna be a much more powerful network with a lot more ca capacity than your own internal connection, then legitimate traffic could still potentially reach you even while a denial of service attack is happening. So how do you do this? Of course, you pay for the service and some vendors even allow you to deploy a virtual appliance paired with your physical or virtual appliance that you install in your own network that deals with detecting the denial of service attack and then communicates with your virtual appliance installed in the ISP's cloud. So you're detecting the DDoS in your own network and then you're signaling the other device in the ISP's cloud and telling it, I'm detecting this type of traffic, make sure you filter it before it even reaches my CPE device. Now Fortinet does this, Alien Vault does this, just to name a couple. All right, so that's it for today. I told you, I promised you, we're gonna be short and efficient. So make sure you remember what black hole routing is, what sinkhole routing is, what's the difference between those two, and about DNS sinkholes as well. I can promise you the exam is going to ask you about this. So until next time, like and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching because next time we're gonna be talking about IoT, embedded systems, and scatter threats. See you next time and good luck.